Welcome to What's Next, Previews, Predictions, and Prognostications. I'm your host, Rhett Power. Joining me is my co-host, John Baldoni. How are you, man? I'm terrific. Excellent. Uh, this is a show that examines what we do now and where we go to prepare for what's next. Whether you own your own company or work for one, you need information on what we can do to and what we, ex what we can expect in the wake of COVID-19 and, and everything that's going on in society. Now, we interview thought leaders, doers from the worlds of business, science, medicine, economics, uh, media, psychology, uh, who will help us shape that new normal. So let's get started in, in doing that. Uh, John? Thank you. Well, our first guest, our, our only guest for today, excuse me, is Gareth Ellis Unwin. And we wanted to do something different on this program because as we discuss the new normal, um, Arts will play a significant role, at least that's my belief. And what better guest could we have than Gareth uh, Ellis Unwood? Uh, Gareth uh, his film, uh, The um, King's Speech, won the Academy Award. I'm sure all of you remember that. Uh, but not only is he a successful film producer, he heads um, the um, film and animation department of Screen Sills, which is an industry-led uh, uh, university. Uh, unit in the United Kingdom that helps uh, uh, create the next generation of film production people. And I've heard um, Gareth speak, and I was so impressed with the work that he's doing with his group, I wanted to bring him on board. Uh, he is a successful producer. He's producing many, many, uh, a or excuse me, award-winning films. Mm -hmm. uh, and in addition to the King's Speech, uh, he was the producer of Zatoon, uh, BAFTA-nominated uh, picture, uh, Kajaki, Exam, and most recently, Steve uh, country. He's a terrific uh, speaker and we're welcome him aboard. So thank you, uh, Gareth. But before you start, I have to ask you, because uh, tell us the story of the evening after you won the Oscar. Hey, everyone. Um, hi, John. I had a sneaky suspicion that that might be the first up on uh, today's playlist. Um, yeah, we, we, I mean, it, it was an amazing obviously uh, an amazing part of uh, part of my life and remember the majority of it incredibly fondly but the um the story around the night after um <laughs> is probably going to stay with me longer than the successes of the of the film so what basically had happened we had a um obviously quite a late night celebrating and we'd we'd all um gone to bed quite late and uh my business partner had decided that um, his daughter, who was quite young at the time, who missed out on all the fun and japes through the night because she was in bed, he was going to get some pictures um, taken of the statuette with little Lara by the swimming pool at the house that we were renting. Um, and, you know, a two-year-old does not have the sort of tensile grip to hold on to an Academy Award. They're quite heavy things. So... Um, it was sort of placed in her hands, which she then promptly released, and it tumbled down the pool steps and sort of um, ended at the, at the water side, um, quite damaged from its encounter. So I, I come down for breakfast the following morning, admittedly with a slightly sore head, um, was presented with my best picture Oscar that had taken the tumble down these pool stairs, and there was flakes of guilt missing and lumps hanging out of it. And I thought, you know... I spent my entire life looking forward to this moment where I'm going to win this amazing prize. And the thing looked like you could get it from a, a sort of jumble sale or a backyard sale. Um, and anyway, so I, I, I phoned up the Academy and I just, I was, I was quite distraught. I mean, obviously, you know, you can't, can't bear umbrage to a, a two year old, but was suitably miffed with my, my business partner at the time. Um, but phoned up the Academy and just said, look, I, I, I think I've broken my Oscar and got this sort of knowing sigh from the other end of the phone yeah. who just and then they just said well look why don't you come by the headquarters it, you know we'll book you in we'll book it into Os oscar hospital you know and who knew this thing existed that there is actually a place for sort of um cosmetic uplifts for damaged statuettes so yeah we um we went in and sat like two naughty school kids outside the principal's office whilst they buzzed and word and and managed to fix the thing so yeah having spent 40 years waiting to win one i i then had to sort of hang my head in shame and sort of go and get it fixed <laughs> that's a great story i mean what's it like i mean the the picture uh the king's speech won i think it won four oscars right yeah what's that like I mean, yeah. to have your 
something that you created like that uh that's i guess still probably the the one of the top selling british films ever well, um, I mean, it, it, it still holds the mantle that it's the highest grossing british independent movie of all time and given the changes in distribution patterns and how we yeah. uh, consume content now that's probably a record that will survive for some some time longer i think the um the, the amazing thing was the the duality of of the success so firstly it was you know critically recognized it was um well applauded by the the film critics we know obviously that it garnered number numbers of awards um, it played brilliantly i mean every room we played to when we were um releasing the film was just a ama an amazing experience every single time telluride toronto london film festival etc but the 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 commercial juggernaut that it became also was a, a vindication on the sort of the commercial assessment right. of the project because it you know every, everyone sort of looks back at most successes and will think it's a it's a fairly easy path and you know when people say oh it was difficult to get it uh, something financed it was difficult to get something off the ground you know lots of um projects in the arts and otherwise have those sort of stories of difficulties but you know right. when we when we acquired the rights in 2006 for the stage play it was based on we couldn't get the bbc interested we couldn't get channel four interested it was at a time when typically a film finance model for an independent was based on having a psb a public service broadcaster involved and we struck out there then there was the the run on the banks and lehman brothers crashed and that meant that a lot of the independent finance that was emanating from the us suddenly ran cold so it was a really tricky show to to get into production um and i think you know you you asked what does it feel like i mean it's it's just <laughs> the inner child sort of wants you to thumb your nose and say see told you <laughs> you know to all of those dissenting voices that maybe stood in the way but no it's a you know it's an incredible moment in my life it's nearly 10 years now i mean that's the the slightly spooky thing that you know that is that it's actually next year is the 10 year anniversary of the of the best picture win so yeah a, an amazing part of my life how did the royal family, how did the royal family take it? Well, do you know what? We never got official vindication of the project, um, you know, we, we, through some other chance encounters and some work I do with a military charity. I, I met one of the princes and I was able to establish that at least his side of the family had enjoyed it. Um, but look, it's the only film that's ever played more than once at the Buckingham Palace Film Club. We know that for, for real. And I'm not in the tower. Uh, admittedly, I haven't been knighted either, but uh, you know, I'm not. I'm not in the tower. Um, so no, one, one would hope that it was a you know a, a fair and positive reflection of, um, of of those those people at that time. That's great. Now, that's thank you. It's a delightful and inside story on, on this, uh, Gareth. Um, but now, as we are, our show is focused on how thinkers and doers, and you certainly are doers, shaping the new normal. So, how is our film artists surviving, at least in the UK, and if you know, in Hollywood as well? So, I think, um, I mean, what what was what was and is quite incredible about the pandemic is the fact that it's a leveler across all scales of production you know every sector and subsector has faced challenges in terms of as distribution models change and different ways that we consume content has changed how we finance has changed but this was something that came along and just didn't pay a care to any of that it didn't matter whether you were a tentpole movie shooting at pinewood or you were a small movie shooting on location and financed independently so it's been this this incredible level up um, in the UK, we have had the benefit of a certain level of support from government in terms of some areas um, have, have, have seen government support. There are some significant gaps, and I don't want to claim that, that we've had an easy ride in the UK. There are significant sections of the filmmaking community that have had a very, very difficult time over the last two to three months. Um, but we are we are starting to see the green shoots of recovery. Um, I, for example, was speaking to a production today that will start shooting at the end of this month. We know that Mission Impossible, Jurassic World and Batman are back into construction in some of our bigger studios. So they are building, they're getting ready to go. Um, but it's been, you know, it's genuinely been a very, very tough time. Um, I think a number of people will 
you know, this will probably be one of the most significant life experiences they live through. Yeah. Absolutely. So, um, what what precautions are happening on film sets? I can almost think that anything more than a one shot is hard to do. So, is any shooting being other than animation yeah. being undertaken now? Well, well, certain shows have continued throughout. You know, for example, the news hasn't gone dark. Um, you know what we call the shining floor TV shows, you know, sofa shows, panel shows, um, have still continued to, to shoot, albeit under some very, very clear and heavy guidance. Um, I, w I was a part of um, working with the British Film Commission, working with the British Film Institute, creating a set of guidance that was established to aid scripted production, so feature films and high-end TV drama, or high-end TV, including comedy and those other, other forms. And that guidance pretty much was built around three pillars. How do you keep yourself safer? How do you keep your colleagues safer? And how do you make your environment safer? And actually, if you take those sort of three tenants and work them back, you can pretty much encompass most aspects of filmmaking. I mean, for those that aren't part of the, the entertainment community, the, 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 the big danger with this particular communicable disease is that in scripted film production, we work in a very intimate way. There's lots of people occupying quite a small space that are handling lots of props and are moving between different departments. So it's, it's a very intimate way of working. It's not like you're in a big factory where you can space people out and put, you know, sort of perspex shielding up between each other. So it is a very intimate way of working. And without sort of careful management, this thing, you know, our world of work could be a petri dish for this disease quite quite easily. So most of the things are around, um, you know, what they call vectors of contagion, i.e., the ways in which you pick up this bug. Um, there is, I think, some some new thinking emerging at the moment that, whereas previously it was thought that the the, the droplets that would carry the disease were likely to either remain on surfaces or were, were quite substantive inside. There, there's there's a emergent thought that the WHO are looking at at the moment where actually some smaller droplets that could be created just by breath could also carry the, dis uh, the disease. So it's been about social distancing. It's been about the use of protective equipment. It's been about trying to reduce the points at which the infection could be easily transmitted. But you're right. Ultimately, the, the, the real tricky bit is the action that takes place in front of camera. Um, you know, intimacy is is very difficult to portray safely at the moment. Um, you know, having large crowd numbers, having a lot of actors occupying the small safe. Like, you know, three months ago, you could put five actors in a car and shoot that as a scene. At the moment, you wouldn't want to, you know, create that enclosed space with 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 five actors that close together for a longer period of time. So. Different shows are dealing with it in different ways. Some have pivoted. Some have looked at moving away from actors in costumes on set to animation, to CG. Others have looked at working the content into a more reduced form, so thinning out the numbers of characters in scenes. Um, there's a lot of sort of clever trickery that can be used in terms of how you photograph a scene or how you choreograph a scene. So, But the truth is, is we're, we're working it out. You know, we are only just getting back into into production so a lot will be um learnt from the from the next couple of months indeed the next well do you so yeah Jeff, do you think that um it, it's going to change uh, the the pandemic and and things that are going on in society do you think that that's going to change tv and movies in the way uh i mean with the stories and i mean is this going to be I mean, I, I know that there are going to be movies about this. I know they're going to be, they're going to cover this in TV shows. Mm. How do you think that's going to all play out? How do you, how do you think that's all going to sort of change the way we, um, I mean, I know it's going to change the way we go and see movies probably for a long time, mm. but I mean, just this, in terms of the content that we're going to get. Yeah, I mean, in, t in terms of the story and content, I mean, I think, you know, a lot of writers and directors will want to recognize this point in global history. You know, I've I've been sent a number of scripts recently that are quote unquote COVID nineteen proof, i.e., you could go and shoot them because of the nature of the content or the characters or the locations. You know, so I think you know we're we're a wily bunch, the filmmaking community. We will work out how to sort of make our stories in this in this current current time. 
I think obviously there will be those that want to memorialize what has happened. Um, it has been a significant global event. I think we will see a lot of content in and around this and the stories that have come from it. Um, in terms of the, the tail of that, the tail as in the, the, you know, how long might that run? I think that there are so many sort of societal and other influences on this. You know, I mean, if, if an effective vaccination is discovered and mass produced and marketed within, you know, three months and track and trace becomes an easy form of working out who has had it and where and how to control that, you know, I mean, most of us here in the UK are seeing this as a period of reasonable adjustment. We're sort of thinking we're probably in it for, you know, six, 12, 18 months, maybe. Um, but we're not we're not yet saying, do you know what? The master reset button has been hit and this is now the new new. It's the new new for now, as it were. Right. One of the things that we talk a lot about in our <clears throat> new normal, um, Gareth, is in our business communities, um, we will probably see um, what's called maybe the hybrid or blended office where 50% mm -hmm. of your employees or a percentage of your employees are in the office and, and, and the other are virtual. Do you see the similar kind of thing in the film industry? So. Ab absolutely. And we're already seeing the, the change uh, take place. So typically, you know, a, a film production would base itself from a given studio or an office location. All of the departments would take separate corridors and spaces within that one sort of skeleton of a building. And then when you move to actual filming, you know, all departments would be present near to set or on set to, to a production. Whereas now we're looking at, well, OK, does the production office actually have to be in a wing to the studio or does it matter if they are four independent people all jumping on zoom calls you know the accounts office does that need to be physically close to set when you might be able to just dispatch a cashier to go and make whatever cash payments are required and recover receipts expenditure reports and things like that so i think there is already a a shift to remote working that i never could have forecast a couple of years ago i think our industry would have been very resistant to it um but there are you know people forget that filmmaking is quite a physical activity you know there is a lot of heavy equipment there are a lot of people that break a sweat when they turn up and do a day's work you know this isn't just about ideas and writing in sort of garricks in in in, in mansions you know this is actually when you get down to the physical production of stuff it takes a lot of sort of heavy equipment lots of lots of people and quite a, a machine to to run it but i think you know we are evolving um, I think a lot of the associated industries and the organizations like Screen Skills, who I know we'll, we'll, we'll come to in a bit, you know, we had to pivot very, very quickly. We had traditionally spent the majority of our delivery in face to face instruction and, you know, being at careers fairs, going out to studios, be, you know, boots on the ground type stuff. And, you know, it was almost like a, a switch had been flipped on the 23rd of March, where suddenly we're all in lockdown. We had a community that we needed to continue to serve and try and keep engaged and um, inspired. Uh, a lot of people have used this lockdown period to 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 skill up and to to really sort of put time back into their education. In fact, a good friend of mine who's a sound recorder said to me it's almost like he's gone back to film school for the last two months. You know, he's been using this time effectively. Um, and so I, I think we did have to see see a, a, a shift. Um, a lot of companies that I'm talking to at the moment that maybe had the big physical premises are now sort of thinking, well, hang on a minute, that's overhead you have to carry irrespective of some significant changes like like, like what's happened over the last few months. So I think, um, you know, people's physical working patterns will see adjustment. Um, but also I think that we've, we've seen some really thrive in this space. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's quite liberating. I mean, I... I've been very careful not to ISO gloat. You know, I've 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 had an okay time of isolation. You know, I've I've not been doing a a, a two hour each way commute into central London, and I've put that time to to doing some healthy things and you know picking up the pen and doing a bit of writing, which I hadn't done for quite a while. So I think people have sort of used the 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 adjustments where they can to to their benefits. I suppose the the tricky thing. And obviously, I, I, I don't know the scenario in the States. I've got lots of friends that are there and, you know, different jurisdictions have dealt with this pandemic in different 
ways. You know, I know where Rhett is at the moment. They had a very different view on how yeah. to, to deal with this. Um, but, you know, we, we went into lockdown in quite an authoritarian way. We were just told, stay at home, do not move. You will, you know, protect the NHS and save lives if you stay at home. So it's quite authoritarian and it was very distinct and it was very, it's happening, you know. Whereas I think the evolution to bring us out of the other side of this will be gradual, will be iterative, will be based on successes found and things working and hopefully avoiding a second spike, etc. But it, but it requires so much more discretion. Whereas I think we went into lockdown in a non-discretionary way. It was, you know, it's easy to follow orders if the orders are very clear and short. Whereas now there's so much that's open to interpretation. I know that it's causing quite a lot of anxiety in people as they try to find their own responses and reflections on, you know, what are we going back to? How are we going back to it? How do I feel about how we're going back to it? Um, so I think the emergence from it is going to be far more complex than, you know, being sort of dumped into it. Gareth, you go ahead, John. I was just going to say, um, and I'm, I'm glad you touched on the personal side, Gareth, because that's kind of where we're uh, a theme of our show, and that's where the arts come in. So I'm going to ask you the big $64,000 question. Why are arts important in time of crisis? Oh, well, I mean, look, if you looked back on the last few months of lockdown, can you imagine that time without the books to read, the music to listen to, the games to play? the film to, films to watch, the TV content. You know, this is why I believe that, that, that the arts are incredibly important. You know, putting aside the commercial driver that they are in most um, most most countries, you know, they are a big part, part of the, 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 the national commercial output. But for me, I found a lot of solace during this time in, in content and creative content. I've gone back and rewatched things that were sort of much cherished, you know, things from my, my youth, et cetera. Um, it's interesting. I, I think I shared this, this story with you, John, on another event recently, but I was asked last year to go out and talk at a, 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 a summit in outer Mongolia. And the, the basic, the, under, the underpinning question for the, for the summit was, you know, if the master reset button was hit, you know, what would you say for, what would you say from history and what would you consign to history? And they, they did a really good job with choosing the speaker, although I was slightly ill prepared for it. Um, and I, I got out to Alice Mongolia and they said, okay, have you got your PowerPoint? No idea. I had to create a PowerPoint for it. Um, could we have a copy of your, your a typed copy of your speech? No, I thought I was just turning up for a, for a conversation. And I said, well, well who, who, who's going on before me? And they said, oh, it's the Nobel Prize winning environmentalist, such and such and such from, from India. I was like, oh, great. OK. And can I ask who's talking after me? And they said, oh, it's the head of the Chinese Space Agency. So there's <laughs> me sandwiched between these two incredible minds um, <laughs> looking, looking to talk about culture. Um, and, you know, I made I, I hope I made a powerful argument for the fact that culture forms such a massive part of our national identity, such a massive part of our world identity. Um, you know, great art will survive all manner of, of, of challenges. And sometimes the best art comes out of those challenging times. You know, if you look at historically when some of the best art has been produced, it is during or near moments of you know global crisis or global change and you sort of think well you know is art, is art reflective of the time it's in or is it actually uh, you know that 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 vanguard of of the next wave of thinking so that's why i think that, that the arts are, um, are are so important is it are, are there some artists uh uh that have really inspired you over the last few months are there, or what type of, what what has inspired you? Is it music? Is it uh, theater? What what kind of what kind of things have inspired you the last few months? Well, there's 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 a couple of things. Um, I mean, one I've got to say, um, this period of lockdown has afforded my wife opportunity to really pursue her goals as an artist, and I've been absolutely um, amazed at how she's purposed this time 
to really develop um, her, her own business and her own skills. You know, she was uh, holding down a part time job and, and doing her art in the evenings and weekends. And this has, has exposed her opportunity to see what a full time version of being a professional artist might be. So working on the basis, I've now won enough brownie points for the evening. Um, <laughs> others, that have, the others that have really, really inspired, inspired me, I mean, some of the commentaries that are that are, are featured in, in some of the British press and, and media. Um, there's a couple of comedians that I, I, I think, you know, in dark times, dark humour quite often just cuts through things. Um, there's a, there's an actress, Michaela Cole, um, in the UK, who's just done a, a, a show for the BBC and how hard she fought as a woman of colour to get that commission and also then retain the rights in the show that she was making. She got offered a... Uh, an eye-watering number by Netflix, but they wanted to assume all rights, and she really stuck to a gun. So that's someone that I've been very impressed by in recent times. Um, but also, just the the stick at itness of of the British filmmaking community. You know, there, there's been all sorts of commentary and discussion. It, there's, it's never been in question that we wouldn't get back into production. It's never been in question that we wouldn't find away through and around this um this horrid bug you know and i've seen in a couple of places this sort of hashtag hashtag we will film again used by some of the younger um you know by some of the younger filmmaking community in the uk so that that's where i i draw my inspiration from it's peers and colleagues that have just said you know what we'll get through this i always think you know the filmmaking community is like flood water you can try and stop it but you're never going to really get in its way it'll always find a way to work it around any da around any dam or under any sort of um, flood defenses so yeah <clears throat> and that brings us to our next subject and what i was most intrigued or uh, very intrigued with you uh, and that's your commitment to the next generation so tell us about screen skills sure so uh, I've always had a, a, a passion for trying to f provide support for the next generation that's coming through. Um, and a lot of that is just down to my own personal experiences trying to break into the industry. You know, I had a, a part-time job at Pinewood Studios at the age of 14. I desperately wanted to make films as a, as a career, but at school I was told I was not academically bright enough and didn't have the the... the the intellectual wherewithal to survive in such a, a, an elite industry. Um, and I've carried that chip on my shoulder all through my professional working life. life. So I'm a great believer in the empowerment of all and that we will get better stories and a more vibrant industry by being inclusive and being diverse in not just those that we, we tell stories with, but what the stories are about and how we enable um, access across all sort of for, all, all, all parts of society. So, when when screen skills, it's it's funny. I, I was I was having one of those sort of. I was just on my way back from the American film market, which is a, a little bit of a it, it it's can with cheaper coffee basically. Um, it's a real sort of lots of stuff getting sold and bought. It's very high energy. It's quite bruising. You know, you're doing meetings on the half hour every half hour for a week, and it's quite tough. And I was flying back. And I was thumbing through a copy of Sight and Sound, which is a British magazine for the for the mm -hmm. industry, and there was a full page advert that was that was there saying that um, as was then, Creative Skill Set were looking for a new head of film. And I sort of came home to Rosie and I said, "Look, this is something that I've come across. I'm sort of thinking, you know, what could be the the next act in 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 my career." Always had a passion for the next generation, and went in and I. I, I met with the CEO, a lady called Sita Kumar, who's just this, she's a walking inspiration in terms of access to the industry and, and, and for, for people that are wanting to look at such a good story. Um, and we, we talked, we talked at great length about the fact that I wanted to be an enabler of people coming into the industry. Um, I wanted to sort of move it away from it feeling like it was a, a worthy endeavour that we should, you know, um, it, it has a commercial driver, it makes commercial sense, it makes societal sense. And, and so we set about talking about how we might do it. And for, for those that aren't aware of the work of Screen Skills, Screen Skills is a UK based charity. It's there to enable those that want to come into the screen industries or those that are already in the screen industries to progress. 
Um, we work by a variety of different means. There is some bursary support. There's a structured mentoring program. There's continuing professional development. There's traineeships. There's apprenticeships. So we're a really broad church, and we work across both, you know, the seven subsectors of screen. So film, high end TV, um, television, non scripted games, animation, children. So we're 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 very broad in the work we do. And it's, ba- you know, we're basically just there to, if someone has an ambition and talent and wants to get in, then we're there to support their their entry. And then once they're in, we hope that the relationship lasts through their full life career. You know, there's always something that we can be doing more to, to help and support the industry. And I think, you know, there, there is no clearer example of the the benefit of our organization than what we've displayed in the last three months i mean we've run i think it's like 300 plus events serving i think on last count over eighteen thousand individuals have attended events we've recently launched this piece of covid19 training which has seen for just over four thousand people take that and become certified so i think we've we've really sort of set our stall over the last the last few months in terms of making the industry realise how important we are to, to their health, to its health, sorry. How do you, um, what's your sense of diversity and, and inclusion in, in the film industry, just sort of in general? Is is there a, I mean, is it diverse? Is it diverse enough? Is it, are there companies that are doing really well at, at bringing in uh, diverse talent? And what's your take on on that from a from a industry insider perspective? So I think broadly, without being uh, hypercritical, we're behind where we need to be. Um, I talk to a lot of uh, filmmakers who are finding it a very challenging space to get into. Um, Some of it is born from the unique nature of filmmaking. You know, quite often crews are pulled together very last minute. You turn to those that you've worked with before. You don't have a very deep sort of bench in terms of people you can turn to. But where I'm seeing some of the really good work uh, happen is, you know, obviously the work we do with with Screen Skills, we are very um, focused on all of our initiatives, um, flushing success in terms of diversity and inclusivity. There are uh, some production companies, given the content that they work with, they do far better at getting uh, certain stories told that are naturally more inclusive. But I think we've got a, a, a long, long way to go um, a dear friend of mine who's been working in LA for some time, uh, a guy called James Griffiths, um, mm. got to do a show out, out there called Blackish. And yeah. you know, he said how wonderfully refreshing it was that he walked on set and he was the minority hire. And he loved that. You know, he thought that was just where it, you know, really where it needs to be, that there's there's that sort of sense of harmony. So it's I think funny, yeah. it's a really yeah. well done show too. Oh, the show's doing ama- amazingly well. So I think we're, we're, we're a little behind. We do have improvement to, to, to find there. And I think it's, it's not just about the industry, but it is also about society's perception of the industry. You know, it does still feel elite. And, you know, I do my best to try and make it feel a little grubbier whenever I'm uh, invited to talk. Um, but we are doing a lot of work in, you know, schools. I think we need better representation in, in higher education, the university um, is obviously a big part of the talent pipeline into the industry. Um, but yeah, it's, a, you know, the, the, the work will never be done. Um, so we've just got to keep putting our shoulder to it and trying to do, to do better. Well, yeah. what intrigued me about it was um, screen skills was, and you hit the nail on the head, it's certainly not elitist because uh, I myself am a graduate of film school, London Film School, which you know of. It's in mm-hmm. your country, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, and one thinks of the artists, the writers, directors, and of course the drama school sort of produces the talent. But your um, uh, skills, uh, screen skills, focuses on the infrastructure, if you will. Um, and I love the story that you talked about driver's licenses. Um, yeah. would you tell that one, so. Well, this is, I mean, a, a good case in point about trying to find the useful enablers to create change. So um, a lot of people that are from underrepresented groups in the UK feel that they have had quite a lot of training. They've been given opportunity and it's now more about um, being given employability and access opportunity. And something when we were revitalising our bursary provision that I asked the team to look at was, 
OK, let, let's see if we can move the needle away from it just being about commissioning courses, buying equipment. What are the real barriers? What are the real barriers to entry? So one of them being those of you that don't know the, the, the sort of the studio landscape in the UK, most 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 of the film studios in the UK are not near public transport. There is means by which to get there. But, you know, Pinewood, Shepparton, Leavesden, these places aren't aren't easy to get to. So. You know, if you don't drive, you can't get yourself to work. So we looked at, OK, well, let's start supporting driving lessons so people can learn to drive and get themselves to where the work is. You know, so that was one of our, our enablers. We also looked at things like, you know, wet weather gear. If you go onto your first location shoot and you're wearing, we don't enjoy the, the, the same temperate climate that you that you have in the US. You know, if you're a location marshal in the UK in the middle of winter, stopping passers by walking through the back of shop in a field for 12 hours a day and you don't have suitable wet weather gear you're going to get ill you're going to get cold you're probably not going to be able to turn up to work so we then said with our bursaries you could come to us and buy jackets and trousers you know you, you get some wet weather gear so trying to find those sort of slightly smaller intervention in smaller interventions that maybe don't grab the same headlines but just make real practical use um that's where we've tried to to sort of apply our bursary provision. Right. And you told a charming story about a, um, a young woman who, um, I believe she was a, a bookkeeper and mm. there were opportunities for that. And uh, she had an opportunity and tell us mm. what happened to her. So. So, so this was part of an initiative. I mean, in the UK prior to COVID-19, we were in a really significant production boom. And what was happening was that there were certain grades and skill that we were having difficulty in recruiting into. Um, and one of those was accountancy. Most people that choose to be lifelong accountants tend to not want the sort of um, freelance nature of film work. They you know, might go and work for one of the big firms like Grant Thornton or McAlvin's or something like that. So they, they might be slightly risk averse in terms of their career uh, ambitions. But we recognize that we, we've got, you know, a pool of talent that are good accountants that maybe hadn't been exposed to the world of film and filmmaking. So we ran a, uh, a weekend event called Skills to Film at Pinewood Studios, and we invited those that lived within 30 miles of the studio that had ever sort of thought about film and filmmaking to come and drop in for a weekend's immersion in into what it, what it looks like. The idea being, if you're building kitchens in a factory in Uxbridge, you could build sets for us if you're running the books at X place. Then, um, and we, we had this really successful weekend. And out of it, one of the, the big success stories was um, uh, an Indian lady who had been bookkeeper at her mum and dad's uh, tire and exhaust company, which had like three shops, um, had always had ambition to work in the creative industries the mum and dad were starting to wind the companies up because they were looking to retirement and this was her window to sort of try and make a jump so she came to our weekend um she thrived she did really really well and she was picked up by the netflix show the crown and initially they just got her in as a cashier so someone that was doing per diem runs and sort of set fairly low level bookkeeping but within two weeks she was promoted to being a mid-level accountant within the accounts office on a really, really significant show. So I think, you know, that that just proves that you can get people that have got skills and developed talent maybe in a different sector and look at bringing them across to to, to fill a, a, a skills gap and need within our industry. Um, we're looking at the moment at something similar around the, the aviation industry. We, we've got two of the main UK airports happen to be quite closely located to two of our big studios. And there's been quite significant redundancies in the aviation industry, as you'll understand, you know, limited international travel, et cetera. So we're looking at, well, has that, you know, has that then flushed a pool of talent that with some sort of, you know, some retraining, some conversion training could be put to use in our in our industry? You know, so looking at all of those different opportunities and um, not being linked to talent just because they haven't done it all their life, you know. Uh, Gareth, what uh, I'm going to get off of the uh, of the organization for a second and ask you another big sweeping question. Uh, what is the movie is, is the movie experience going to change and should it change after this? And 
what what are moviegoers going to want in an experience now? Because now we've been conditioned the last three four months to stay at home and watch watch on our TVs. Mm-hmm. Is it going to be hard to get that back? And and how do we do that? How do you do that? Well, I think um, my my honest answer is that it's a very different experience. If you are going and watching something in a theatre, even given the um, you know technological revolu- evolutions that we've had in home cinema and and viewing, you know. And you can you can have a brilliant setup at home now. You know, most TVs have decent sound. That used to be the big failing. Most TVs would have a, a speaker about that size, irrespective of how big the screen was. But most people got def- decent sound systems, decent screens. But it's a shared experience. And unless you're going to invite 250 people to come and sit on your couch and eat, <laughs> eat your popcorn, it's a very, very different experience. Now, albeit for the short term, you know, the cinemas are opening again in the UK. They're moving to a sort of 30 to 40 percent occupancy. They're not going to be filling the auditoria. They're going to this sort of checkerboard seating plan to make sure that people have got space between them. So, again, we've got this period of adjustment to get through. But just like I don't think COVID-19 will see the death of theatre in terms of stage and stage acting, I don't think it will see the death of, of cinemas and, and the th- the benefit of the theatrical performance because it is it's a it's a different thing um is my honest hope but then i i make movies for a living <laughs> yeah that's good I, like, I like my i like my movies being watched in cinemas and i you know I, I like sitting in amongst an audience on something that i've made where you know i know that there's going to be a jump scare coming in a couple of seconds or that there's a you know a comedy line that's going to land so it's um yeah i mean it's going to be a very, very interesting period of time. Obviously, there's a lot of jockeying at the moment with a lot of the titles that were due to release this year. So Mulan, Tenet and those other shows are sort of moving around the, the schedule a little bit. But hopefully that will calm down. Hopefully the reopening in the UK will go, touch wood, w- without incident. And, and over time, the, the occupancy and the, the footfall will start to increase. But yeah, I'm very much hoping that there will still be a place for theatrical entertainment. Well, uh, Gareth, as we're getting close to the end here, you've been a wonderful guest. And I think what uh, what makes you terrific is, uh, in addition to holding an Oscar, um, you um, you have are one who has committed to the future of your industry. And in doing so, you've illustrated the, as you call it, the wily skills of filmmakers. But that's the kind of wiliness or uh, uh, resolute power and perseverance we're all going to need as we create this new normal. So I would like to say that film is going to be, um, film industry entertainment will may point us in the right directions beyond the enjoyment factor, beyond the art center, but it's sheer inventiveness. And mm. that's something that you brought to us. So we thank you for that. So. I think, I think there, there, there always has been and will ever more need to be an entrepreneurial skill in, in the arts and, and um, particularly in sort of film and filmmaking. Uh, so many times we've heard the apparent death knell ring, you know, the death bell ring for our industry. And I think, you know, this is just a, a different version uh, uh, again. But I do think it's important for any industry to recognise the anxieties that the recent period of time has caused it caused in the workforce all those things that people that work for us typically would go and do to relax recuperate and get away from their work selves has maybe not been available to them and something that I've definitely been trying to do both at screen skills and in my own sort of personal professional life is to try and role model good behavior that has a heavy dose of optimism about it I think people generally need to feel hope at, at, at this moment in time. And it is a period of adjustment and it's been a roller coaster. Um, but I do hope we all see that there is another side to this coming and it's not going to be forever. Yeah. Well, that's, John, you want to wrap it up? I, we do have to. Uh, I think up. that's it. That's terrific. Uh, Gareth, you've been a, a wonderful guest and thank you. I know it's, you are have lots of things on your plate. So thanks for carving out some space for us. My pleasure. <laughs> Thank this you. has been another episode of What's Next, uh, previews, predictions, and prognostications. Stay tuned for more episodes coming. On behalf of my co-host, Rhett uh, Power, we say thank you for watching.